Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sharon Bonney. I'm the CEO for the Coalition on Adult Basic Education, and I am so delighted to welcome you to our webinar today, Bridging Access to COVID-19 Information Among Adult Learners. So we have a lot of people joining us today, and we are able to provide this webinar thanks to Work Ready Mobile. So I'd like to introduce Keith Thode, who is the president of Work Ready Mobile. And while I'm introducing him, I'd like to encourage you all to introduce yourselves in the chat box. Keith? Uh, good afternoon, I'm Keith Thode. I'm the CEO and Chief Scientist for Work Ready Mobile. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, be a part of what we have going on today. Um, if, uh, here we go. Oh. We'll try one more time. Here we go. There's a little bit about us. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Work Ready Mobile is a mobile app and platform that we built specifically for uh, the adult basic education space. Our work first started um, in, um, in the with Work Ready Mobile with Dallas County Community College District. And now we're in three states and different programs. We have uh, community colleges, we have public school systems, literacy councils, nonprofit organizations all using versions of Work Ready Mobile. Um, and we built Work Ready Mobile to help retain students uh, and help improve their gains and capture their impact. Uh, so with Work Ready Mobile, it is your own branded mobile app that you get for your programs. Uh, we track the students, their participation hours. It provides other supplemental resources to help them um, overcome the other challenges with being a student. So today, right now, there's the programs are using it a lot for providing access to emergency feeding resources in their communities and being notif notifying them of employers that are hiring and things like that. Uh, in this critical time. Uh, for your students, it's your one-stop shop for their mobile app. So right now you might be asking your students to go to this website for this and this website for that and what have you. All can be delivered through uh, the one place, the mobile app. Uh, most specifically, it has a communication infrastructure so that when you work so your teachers can communicate with their students and share documents, the students can communicate back um, as an administration, you also have the ability to communicate out to your students all via the app. Uh, there's also the goal setting exercises that most of you do with your students. This now automates that process. So they put their information in the Work Ready Mobile and now automated reminders go out to the students as they're getting close to some dates where they said they were going to achieve a certain goal. It also reminds them to show up to class every day, which can be even more of a challenge here in the, in the virtual environments. So getting those students to do the very right next thing to help them be successful. Uh, again, we feel like it's a win-win all the way around. Um, for the administrators, you know, we're really doing more, we're retaining more students, they're staying for longer, and we're also capturing their gains, which a lot of times it's a challenge where the student makes a gain. Are you actually going to find that out and efficiently get that in a way to report it? Uh, to help with your funding and your other impact measurement. Uh, for the teachers, it allows them to communicate so much more with their students with a lot less effort. It's also a protected environment, so students and teachers aren't having to share cell phone numbers and there's no communication that needs to happen between students and teachers or navigators and teachers outside of the system. So it's a, it's a better solution for all that way as well. Uh, again, we love being a part of the co-aid community, so we are doing some special granting around this time. Um, some of you folks have access to emergency funds, and if you wanted to implement uh, Work Ready Mobile and had some funds and things to support that, you know, again, we would appreciate it. It would, uh, it would help us serve more people, but for right now, you know, we're not, for our co-aid members, we're not charging any setup fee for, the, for getting your own branded app and no monthly fees until the crisis is over or until your next fiscal year. Um, it's not a very expensive solution anyway, but even with that, you know, we'll, you know, we'll agree to you um, whatever you can pay and agree to pay for an extended period of time. We'll kind of make that contract with you so that you know that you're getting it for free now and that you're getting it for only what you can afford to pay for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, 
Also, we're doing some other things around the COVID response that you can see here. We're doing specific training uh, for folks using our technologies to help them be, um, communicate and be successful in this uh, time of significant transition. We also have a learning management platform that we're providing to folks under similar granted terms. Um, and also, we're doing some more virtual conferences and virtual job fairs. We're in some discussions with several of the state associations about how to help them still be successful and, um, and provide their CEU credits and their financial sustainability that comes from having the conferences supporting them in that. And we also have um, some, you can see here, a free resource. We have some online training using our learning platform, providing you with kind of you and anybody that wants for the public some specific COVID-19 training and also some resiliency around just mental well-being and uh, physical well-being and parenting in the time of this quarantine. So that's a great free resource for you to help you uh, be successful during this time. And uh, with that, we again really appreciate just being a part of the CoAve community. And uh, I just want to thank you again for letting us talk today. Thank you so much, Keith. And that is so generous to be offering grants and to be offering this information out to our members. So thank you very much for that. And to all of our members, of course, this is this is being offered, this webinar is being offered free of charge with thanks to Work Ready Mobile. So thank you so much for that. Um, I also did want to make a few other quick updates. We have Advocacy April and why we feel this is so important is because as so many of you know, there's a lot of challenges that come to this co with this COVID crisis. Many, many teachers and administrators that I've talked to are trying to ramp up and get their adult learners online, get the laptops that they need and the Wi-Fi that they need. And so COEB is working really hard to bring in funding for that, but we need your help. You can see up here, um, we have our usual ask for the WIOA funding to keep the doors open for the 2000 plus programs across the country. We also have this additional $1 billion ask for federal funding. And we also wanted to mention that there is $32 billion stimulus funding, but that was pushed down in state block grant funds. But just to be aware, adult education was not written into the stimulus funding. However, you can ask your governor and we have put together wording for that to help you. So if you go to coaid.org, there's details on that. But lastly, I wanna mention that on April 21st, we're going to be getting into a how-to session, a quick webinar where we will have leaders in the field talk about how they've been able to help tap resources and what they've done in their state. So I just wanna encourage you all to join us for that. I'll put a link in the chat box shortly. I also wanted to mention that we have a number of targeted webinars specifically around navigating the challenges of COVID-19. Many of them have had at least you know, 700, 800 people sign up for them. We've increased our seats count to a thousand so that as many people in the field that need these resources can join us. So you can go to coeb.org for more details on that. And now without further ado, I just wanna introduce today's wonderful presenters. We have with us an outstanding um, lineup. We have Marian Fidelli, we have Dr. Erica Shelton and Dr. Trina Childers. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to read their bios real quickly. Um, we have with us Dr. Trinita Childers is a health researcher specializing in health equ equity and community engagement. She has extensive experience working with vulnerable populations, including racial and ethnic minorities, immigrant communities, and rural populations. Dr. Childers' experience also includes translating health research and information into plain language in both U.S. and international settings, and her training emphasizes racial equity and social justice frameworks. Dr. Erica Shelton is a board certified emergency medicine physician and health services researcher. Dr. Shelton's research focuses on optimization of healthcare access for vulnerable populations to decrease health disparities and enhance value and efficiency of emergency care. Her work is increased at aiming patient, I'm sorry, increasing patient and community engagement in the healthcare system. Dr. Marianne Fidelli McLeod is a managing technical assistant consultant at AIR and a director of the adult learning practice area involved in the field of adult education since 1991. Wow. <laughs> so all of these friends come to us from the American Institute for Research, which we have so much respect for. They're a national partner of COAID and they do fantastic work. So I turn this over to our presenters now. So thanks everybody for hanging on. Again, this is Marianne Fidelis McLeod with the American Institute for Research. Um, in terms of today's uh, webinar presentation, we um, 
the goal and purpose of today's webinar is to provide examples and model how to share medically accurate information with adults with low levels of literacy and English language learners. Uh, another goal is to share credible resources that are relevant to the lives of adult learners across the various domains of their lives uh, as family members, community members, workers, and patients. Uh, the main material that's going to substantiate today's session uh, was developed at American Institutes for Research in the form of plain language COVID-19 uh, FAQ. And that plain language FAQ is written at an eighth grade level, which would be appropriate to many of our learners. For those of you who work with and have in mind uh, adults with a lower than eighth grade reading level, uh, both native English speakers and ELLs, I would say as a fellow educator, look for the teachable moments. Uh, some of the things that uh, occurred to me were a focus on building vocabulary, um, and utilizing resources as a means of doing project-based learning. I know in the states that I work with, and of course, probably all of us right now are connecting with students through communities of practice and online learning. And we're hoping that today's presentation and resources would provide a basis for engaging in rich literacy and language activities um, that are rigorous and utilize credible and reliable sources. Uh, so for our agenda today, we're going to be using, uh, I'll hand things off to Dr. Shelton next, and she'll be going through the COVID-19 FA, FAQ document, which is available in English, Spanish, and Mandarin. Uh, then we'll hand things off to uh, Dr. Childers, who will get into strategies for sharing COVID-19 information with adult learners, uh, utilizing a variety of of different credible information. And then we'll have probably now about 15 minutes for the Q&A session. Um, in terms of the Q&A, we were, thank you for everybody who sent questions in advance. Your questions were used to inform the development of this presentation. And when we get to that final section of this presentation, you'll see a number of your questions uh, that, were, that were asked and are included and we provided a response to. I will say there were a number of questions that pertain to really important areas that we're not going to be addressing in today's session, uh, such as distance learning and federal and state policies related to distance learning, assessment, um, and accountability. Uh, those topics are important and will be addressed through uh, other webinars and resources offered through Octave's, uh, Octa and Octave's Investments, as well as COAVE. Uh, in groups like the American Institutes for Research. So I wanted to let you know we did see those questions and we were selective in those that we were uh, going to address so that we're on target today. If we have time, there's a Q&A pod at the bottom of your screen in the toolbar. Uh, if you have some specific questions and if we have a few minutes, we might get to those. Uh, next slide, Sharon. Thank you. I want to just for a moment introduce the American Institutes for Research. Um, uh, our mission is to apply behavioral and social science research and evaluation towards improving people's lives, and we have a special emphasis on the disadvantaged. Uh, that is our website address. Next slide. Uh, Part of a, a, to meet AIR's mission in this unique time, uh, we've developed, and it's immediately accessible from our homepage, a COVID-19 uh, response and resource feature. Uh, a little later in the session, I'll be going through the resources that are, we thought of as most applicable to the lives of our learners and to us as educators. Uh, next slide, please. Without further ado, I want to hand things off to Dr. Erica Shelton, who will be going through uh, the FAQ on COVID-19 developed by AIR. Erica? Sure. Thank you for that introduction, Marianne. Um, and thank you for uh, setting the agenda and setting the stage for this talk. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Erica Shelton, and I work as an emergency medicine physician in Baltimore, Maryland. So you'll see on your screen a screenshot of the COVID FAQs that are recently published uh, by the American Institutes for Research, or AIR. AIR, as uh, Marianne mentioned, has created a plain language FAQ document that addresses a variety of topics related to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
questions were drawn from numerous reliable government sources, including the Centers for Disease Control or CDC. The FAQ document was developed as a resource for schools, daycares, healthcare organizations, and other public centers to distribute. It is designed to make this information accessible and comprehensible to everyone, regardless of education level or background. And as mentioned, it is currently available in English, Spanish, and Mandarin. You can use the language and resources that you hear today in this presentation and uh, use in the AAR FAQs when speaking with adult learners about COVID-19 and the communities that you serve. So to start with, let's go over some frequently asked questions about COVID derived from the material in the AIR FAQ document. Uh, next slide, please, Sharon. So we'll start with a frequently asked question. How do I know if I might have COVID-19? For most patients, typical symptoms include mild to severe illness with fever, muscle aches, cough, sore throat, and shortness of breath. These are some of the most common symptoms. Some patients have reported some more atypical symptoms as well, including di diarrhea, as well as sudden unexplained loss of taste and smell. So if you have a medical emergency, such as severe shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, um, what we have uh, uh, recommended is calling 911 and telling um, the, the um, uh, representatives there about symptoms. But otherwise, in uh, any other situation that is not an emergency, calling your doctor's office and discussing symptoms over the phone is, is really the, the, the step to take. So your doctor can discuss next steps, including whether or not you should be tested for COVID-19. For milder cases, your doctor will likely recommend that you rest at home and self-quarantine. And then if you become severely ill, it is at that point that you might need hospital care. Next slide, please. So our next question is, how can I avoid getting COVID-19 or passing it on to other people? So one of the most important things that people can do to protect themselves is to practice social distancing, which means staying about six feet away from others. The CDC, um, also recommends some other measures, including avoiding shaking hands, avoiding touching one's face, and covering uh, your mouth with your elbow when you cough or sneeze. The CDC also recommends wearing a cloth mask in public settings where other social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. And for example, these might be areas like grocery stores, pharmacies, and uh, public transportation. And this is especially important in areas of significant community-based transmission. People who are ill with a respiratory disease can also wear a mask to avoid spreading their illness to others. Of note, wearing a mask is also helpful to avoid spreading the new coronavirus by people who are infected, but may not, but may not know it yet because they have mild or no symptoms. Other precautions that can be taken uh, include not visiting nursing homes or retirement or other long-term care facilities unless providing critical assistance or services. So typically this means only visiting these um, uh, areas if one is a member of the staff that works there and not uh, visiting um, relatives or, or friends. Uh, another uh, precaution that can be taken is disinfecting frequ frequently used items um, and surfaces that are used often. And then lastly, um, washing hands often uh, with soap and water for at least 20 seconds each time. And this is especially important after coughing, sneezing, blowing your nose, or going to the bathroom. And also uh, washing hands before eating or preparing food is uh, essential. Next slide, please. Another question often asked is, why are people being told to avoid large gatherings? So discussion is ongoing as to whether transmission can actually be airborne or only by droplets. But the important thing to remember is that the risk substantially increases with close person-to-person -person contact. So in large groups, more people have a chance of getting the virus or passing it on to someone else. Viruses can spread quickly, and it's hard for physicians and hospitals to take care of everyone if many people get sick at the same time. It's helpful to keep in mind that hospitals are also taking care of people with other health needs aside from COVID-19, such as childbirth, car accidents, and other emergencies. Health professionals are doing all they can to try to slow down how quickly COVID-19 spreads so that they can help all those presenting to hospitals who have need um, for health care. So if we slow down the spread of illness by avoiding large crowds, then hospitals have a chance to recover and will have the supplies they need to take care of people. Next slide, please. 
Another question is um, about many of the terms that we've been seeing in the media lately, isolation, quarantine. What do all these terms mean? So isolation is for people who already have COVID-19, who already have that diagnosis. It means keeping them separated from people who don't have the virus. So for example, hospitals are isolating people with, or patients with COVID-19 from other patients who do not have the virus. Quarantine is for people who may have been exposed to someone who is sick, but they don't actually have a formal diagnosis of COVID-19. So it means that you should stay away from others to avoid getting someone else sick. This usually means staying at home and avoiding contact with other people for 14 days. Next slide, please. So in light of the uh, self-quarantining that uh, many, many people have uh, had to undergo, undergo in the uh, past few weeks, uh, one question that uh, is often asked is, can I still get food delivered to my home? And the answer to this question is yes. So restaurants follow safety guidelines for sanitation and for food preparation. And people can use drive-through delivery or pickup options. And in addition to these things, there are also some additional safety precautions that, um, that one can take. And these include the following. So checking to see if you can pay online or over the phone um, to avoid uh, any unnecessarily uh, handling of money or contact with uh, services, uh, excuse me, surfaces uh, that don't need to be touched. Asking the delivery person to leave packages at the door or on the porch. And then if the uh, restaurant um, uh, requires that a person go um, and uh, go in person and curbside pickup isn't is not an available option then making sure to maintain a, a six feet six feet of distance between um, yourself and the cashier is is also uh, recommended um, lastly because carry out bags and containers have been touched recently by others um, washing hand washing hands after handling these is is also highly recommended and then finally, disposing of all packaging and washing hands, again, just before eating is, um, is another precaution that's also very important. Next slide, please. Um, so another frequently asked question is, what if I need help finding food during the COVID-19 pandemic? And uh, this is a question that I'm sure many of you, as you uh, work with adult learners in your communities, um, may encounter, and it's, it's um, important to have a, um, a resource that um, we can direct uh, various community members in need to. So 211 is, is really helpful for this purpose. Um, in many states, dialing 211 gives people in need a chance to speak with someone who can try to connect them with agencies and organizations that offer help in their area. 211 um, offers assistance in finding food, housing, utility assistance, employment supports, internet access, childcare support, as well as drug and alcohol treatment, mental health resources, and other basic needs. 211 is a 24 seven hotline that is connected to a trained team who can give up to date information. Um, people who'd like to access 211 can do so by dialing 211 on the phone um, or uh, visiting 211.org. Um, and uh, as I know that many of you actually would like to access 211 and find out about 211 services in your specific area. I'm seeing a couple of questions uh, to that effect in the chat box. Um, what I'd like to say is that if you have a service to, that you want to suggest to 211, or if you want to access 211 resource data for your clients, the easiest thing to do is actually to just go directly to the website 211.org. Um, and then uh, looking, uh, scrolling down towards the bottom of the screen, there's a tab that says for service providers. Clicking on that tab will allow you to actually search by your zip code or city and state in the search bar to visit the region specific website uh, for contact information and instructions. Um, next, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Chanita Childers, who will be discussing strategies for sharing COVID-19 information. Thank you, Dr. Shelton. Um, Next slide, please. We can go ahead one more. Thanks. So I'll start by having us think about the adult learner population and their needs. Low reading literacy is one concern that may make it challenging for adult learners to get the information they need related to COVID-19. Another concern is low health literacy. Health literacy refers to the ability 
to understand and process health information as people make health-related decisions. According to the National Reporting System for Adult Education, most education students are enrolled in basic education and in English language learning programs. In program year 2017 to 2018, 40% of participants were enrolled in adult basic education, 11% were enrolled in adult secondary education, and 49% were enrolled in ESL programs. So adult learners include people who may have limited reading literacy and also those who may be non-native English speakers. Adult learners might also include people who are undocumented. Their needs and concerns are unique as they figure out how to get health care while also keeping themselves and family members safe. Next slide, please. So given this information, we want to use a range of methods to communicate with our adult learner population. Low literacy written materials can offer important information that people can reference and share with friends and family members. If written materials include pictures or visual representations of health information, that's another good way to convey facts about COVID-19 to community members. And I'll share an example of that in an up upcoming slide. In addition to low literacy written materials, Word of mouth is still a powerful tool, but since we are following recommended stay at home orders and social distancing measures, we really have to think creatively about how to effectively spread information by word of mouth in the COVID era. Community recreation centers, health clinics, and places of worship also have often have online bulletin boards where answers to frequently asked questions could be placed. I'm thinking specifically about organizations, websites, and Facebook and Twitter pages. Also, recognizing that not all community members go online for information, community-based organizations can set up a dial-in number to hold a community conversation where they discuss COVID-19 information and resources and maybe answer questions from community members. The dial-in number approach might work well for organizations that serve a larger population, but for those that serve fewer people, a call team or a phone tree might be effective. So using a phone tree approach, you could have 10 leaders or peer educators within the organization who are each responsible for calling 10 community members. Together, all 10 leaders would reach 100 community members. So word of mouth communication can still be effective and it doesn't always have to mean in-person communication. When you registered for this webinar, some of you mentioned the digital divide and limited access to technology. So going back to using phone calls to share information might be an especially important um, approach for those who have limited access to technology. Lastly, since many students are English language learners, it's important to consider language barriers and have staff and have staff or peers who can share this information in people's native language when that's possible. And in an upcoming slide, I'll also share a couple of websites that will allow people to select their preferred language to get information about COVID-19. And just to be clear, I'm viewing these strategies as a multi-pronged approach to sharing information where we're not choosing between these options. Instead, we're working to use as many of these strategies as we can. Next slide, please. So I mentioned using low literacy materials with students, and I'd like to share this visual as an example. SCOPE is a research and communication organization based in Australia that primarily creates resources for people with complex intellectual or physical disabilities. The image on the right is an excerpt from a packet they created to ensure that information about COVID-19 was accessible. It uses images and plain language to explain what the virus is and how it's transmitted. It might be a helpful resource as you think about ways to share information about COVID-19 with adult learners here in the US. One thing I'll just say as a disclaimer is that the document includes some phone numbers, and since that document was created in Australia, the phone numbers listed there would not be applicable in the United States, but the content is still very valuable. So now I'll turn it over to Marianne, who will share additional resources with you. Thank you. Next slide, Sharon. Uh, AIR's Adult Education uh, Research and Technical Assistance Center has uh, identified and de uh, identified and curated several resources uh, that are drawn from among the uh, various projects we've conducted for uh, the federal government as well as state governments 
uh, over the course of several years. Uh, the curated resources address health literacy, digital literacy, online uh, blended teaching and learning. Uh, so the health literacy resources, as well as the digital literacy resources, are drawn from a project we're currently conducting for uh, US Department of Ed, OCTE, the Teaching Skills That Matter in Adult Education project. And so they are the most recently developed resources. Uh, in particular, it might be valuable to you uh, as you have uh, engaged with your students to build their health literacy or the health literacy issue briefs uh, and other resources that can be found built into those materials, which we've developed with a um, number of subject matter experts across the countries who across the country have been very valuable partners to us uh, in this project and beyond. Uh, and when considering health literacy, we, we take on how to support your students in building skills to find, understand, evaluate, communicate, and act on health information. Um, I want to draw your attention to those as well as the COVID-19 frequently asked uh, questions that will be posted on this the digital literacy and online learning materials. Uh, in addition, the slides from today's presentation as well as um, a recording from today's presentation will be posted and included among these resources. Next slide, Sharon. More broadly, uh, part of AIR's COVID-19 response has been the creation of a podcast series uh, dealing with that explores how the coronavirus pandemic has affected our lives and how we can address those challenges uh, as educators, as uh, community members, uh, relevant to our adult learners in their lives as family members and parents are the podcasts that deal with how to create supportive learning environments at home uh, while our children and our family members are engaged in online, our school age children are engaged in online learning. Uh, there are also podcasts for educators. The most recent episode, number four, Communities of Practice, are targeted for you, educators who are endeavoring to um, teach and learn and conduct professional development in online environments using communities of practice. Um, so those are, this series will go on and different sessions will be added to it. Uh, we're hoping to provide just in time and ongoing support to you and the larger community of educators in the United States. Next slide, please. Uh, with that, we're going to go to the Q&A session. Uh, again, the questions were drawn from questions you asked and, and, uh, I'm going to hand things off to uh, Erica and Trinita. Um, okay, uh, it looks like we've lost the screen sharing ability. Yes, I wonder if, I think, Sharon, if you're there, we can't I, hear you. Yes, I'm here, would you like me to okay. That back up, I can share that screen again. Oh yeah, terrific, thank you. Yes, if you wouldn't mind and just resuming the slide presentation where we left off at slide 19. Thank you. You're welcome. Great, and so uh, these questions that we'll address now are ones that were sent in advance. Um, and I believe if we go to the next slide, Erica and uh, Trinita, you all will take this on. And Dr. Eric, Chilters, are you there? Here. Can people hear me? Yes. Can folks hear me? Yes. I can hear you okay, now. Okay, great. Wonderful. All right. So the first question that we um, will discuss is, can you address some of the COVID-19 myths out there? Um, several people submitted questions related to addressing the myths about COVID-19 that are circulating among students. To answer this question, one approach would be to direct the student to trusted information sources. The, Center for Disease, the Centers for Disease Control, known as the CDC, and the World Health Organization are two trusted sources of information related to COVID-19. The CDC has a section on their website called Rumor Control, 
and the World Health Organization has a section called Mythbusters. In the next couple of slides, I'll share a little bit about each of these websites. Next slide, please. Thank you. This is a screenshot of the coronavirus.gov website, which was developed by the CDC. When you go to this website, there's a section called Latest News. Um, if you'll click once, Sharon, um, that's where you'll find a link that says Rumor Control. When I visited this link, most of the rumors that are addressed are related to the government response to COVID-19, including information about potential scams that are currently circulating. For example, one scam is that people are calling households saying they can get your financial stimulus funds quickly, then they ask you for your personal information, including your bank account or your social security number. So this is one of the scams listed on that site. The coronavirus gov website is one place you can direct students when dispelling rumors related to COVID-19. Another thing I'd like to point out is that once you get to the rumor control website, will you do one more click, Sharon? There's an option for, um, for folks to select the ability to read information in different languages. This link provides access to information in about 20 different languages, which might be useful for students who are English language learners. Next slide, please. Another credible resource for COVID-19 information is the World Health Organization. I'd like to point out a few sections on their website as well. The bright red box that says emergency coronavirus disease pandemic is where you'd click to read more information about the virus. And that's also where you'd go to find the section called Mythbusters. In the middle, where it says COVID-19 quick links, you'll see several options, including a scam alert, advice for the public, and advice for health workers. Then the last section I'll highlight, Sharon, if you'd click once, is on the far right. This section describes how people can use an app called WhatsApp to get information about COVID-19 in their preferred language. Many people with family outside the United States use WhatsApp to communicate with family and friends in different countries. Some of your students who are English language learners may already have the app, so this is a resource that can help them access information in their primary language. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Shelton to discuss a few of the more popular myths. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Trinita, for that introduction. So um, the first myth that we'll be discussing here is one that claims that some climates, particularly hot and humid climates, make it hard for the virus to pass from person to person. The fact is that the new coronavirus can be transmitted regardless of climate. There is no evidence to suggest that people who live in hot, humid climates don't need to take the precautions we've been discussing today. Everyone, regardless of the climate they live in, should be doing everything they can to protect themselves from COVID-19, including the precautions discussed today, such as social distancing and frequent hand washing, among others. Next slide, please. Another myth is one circulating that claims that people of certain ages are not at risk of contracting the virus. Um, and so uh, the question that's asked here and uh, that is uh, posed on the WHO Mythbuster site that uh, Dr. Childers referenced earlier is, does the new coronavirus affect older people or are younger people also susceptible? The fact is that people of all ages are susceptible to coronavirus infection and severe illness with this infection. There are reported cases of younger people with severe illness who have been requiring hospitalization and even ICU level care as well as a recent infant death in Connecticut. That being said, older people and those with pre-existing health conditions or immune systems that do not function properly are thought to be at the highest risk of severe illness. If patients are severely ill and require admission to a hospital, some treatments have shown promise, including hydroxychloroquine. It is important to note, however, that this and other medications showing promise are not cures. While they have shown promise, their clinical effectiveness clinical effectiveness is still being studied. People still need to continue to take every precaution they can, especially social distancing and hand washing uh, to prevent infection. Next slide, please. And then the last myth we'll be discussing um, is one that has been circulating um, regarding 5G mobile networks and uh, a uh, proposed uh, ability of these networks to spread COVID-19. This is simply not true. 
It is important that people in the communities we serve be educated that viruses cannot travel on radio waves or mobile networks. As evidence, we can point to the fact that COVID-19 is spreading in many countries that do not even have 5G mobile networks. Emphasis that COVID-19 is spread when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or speaks, or when a person touches a contaminated surface and then touches their eyes, mouth, or nose is key. Next slide, please. Another question that was submitted was asking, how did the coronavirus start? So there are actually many different types of coronavirus. Um, some affect the animal kingdom and some affect uh, the human species. And um, the fact is that uh, many of the coronavirus that, coronaviruses that have been circulating among human beings for years cause symptoms that we are all often uh, familiar with, such as those causing mild colds. Um, others have caused small, severe human disease outbreaks in the past, such as the coronaviruses that caused SARS in 2003 and MERS in 2012. The new coronavirus that is responsible for COVID-19 is different from these and was only identified in December of 2019. So the virus um, can sometimes transmit from the, an, an animal species um, to a human. And when the virus does this, the virus can change or mutate when undergoing this transmission from one species to another. And so a disease outbreak can happen when a virus that is common in an animal, such as a pig, bat, or bird, undergoes changes and then passes to a human. Um, transmission from an animal to a human and the subsequent mutation of the virus is what is thought to have caused the current coronavirus outbreak. And I have some uh, references uh, at the bottom, uh, which one can link to um, at Hopkins Medicine, as well as CDC, uh, that can go into some more detail for those of you that are interested. Next slide, please. I also wanted to go over some information for families who may have a person in the home who is diagnosed with COVID-19, but is not so sick that this person has to be hospitalized. Um, and it's important to note that this information also applies to families with a member who has been told to go on self-quarantine for 14 days, even if that individual does not have a formal COVID-19 diagnosis. So the question um, is really just how can families minimize exposure to other people in the home if a family member becomes ill, but is well enough to stay at home? So first, it's recommended that any sick family members with COVID-19 try to isolate away from healthy family members and children. Um, main caregivers for this sick family member should be those who are not at high risk, meaning those who are over age, meaning those who are not over age 60, or those, and not those who have underlying health issues or pre-existing health conditions or poorly uh, performing immune uh, health systems uh, like we discussed before. Um, these relatives can bring the sick family member food, drinks, and medication to the bedside. Um, but they should be careful to clean their hands before entering the room where the sick family member uh, is and also careful to clean their hands after leaving this room. And they should also limit their time in the room um, with the sick person and not touch their face uh, while in the room. Next slide, please. If masks are available, um, it's also important to have the sick person put on a mask if they will be near other family members or if others who are entering the room um, uh, or others who are entering the room um, to minimize spreading the virus uh, in the air. Caregivers can also wear a mask if available. Um, and in some of the upcoming slides, I'll actually be discussing where to obtain information on how to make do-it-yourself masks that you may want to share with adult learners in the communities you serve. Um, on these websites, you'll actually see some pictures about um, how to uh, make these masks. Um, the other uh, piece of information is that if, if family members have a separate space for the sick person, a space where they can access the restroom without traveling through common spaces, that's actually the best approach. Um, so if the, if the home has more than one bathroom, that bathroom should be dedicated for use by the sick person. However, um, it's, uh, we recognize that um, not every home has this option available. So if the bathroom has to be shared by sick and well people in the home, then the toilet should only be flushed with the lid closed and the surfaces in the bathroom, such as countertops, doorknobs, toilet handles, and other frequently sur touched surfaces um, are cleaned with a disinfecting household cleaner after the sick person leaves the restroom. 
It's an also important to remember to clean uh, any clothes that the sick person has been wearing in very hot water. Uh, next slide, please. And then um, another question that was submitted in advance is uh, the following. Undocumented patients who might have concerns about seeking health care or applying for government benefits for family members, what should they do? So the best advice that I can give you is that medical encounters are supposed to be confidential. Uh, information that is exchanged in the doctor-patient communication is considered to be privileged, and this is what is supposed to happen. While I can't speak for every healthcare setting everywhere, in the ER where I work, we see many undocumented patients and we treat them according to the requirements of their illness. If they need to be tested, we test them. If we need to admit them to the hospital, we admit them. If we think that they can be safely discharged home, we do that as well. And when we are able to safely discharge these patients, we also provide them with community clinic follow-up options so that they can continue to receive care. These community clinics work with many undocumented individuals in the population they serve as well. Learning the local landscape of which community clinics and organizations have experience serving these populations may be one way to provide tailored resources for undocumented patients. And I'll turn it over here to Dr. Childress to speak more on this topic. Thank you. I'll just add, um that if you have students who are undocumented, a primary concern they might have is who they can trust. And I'll say that the specific climate that undocumented people face really does vary depending on the state, the city, or even the neighborhood that people live in. So connecting with the community-based organization is important because they generally have a sense of the local on-the-ground landscape that people are navigating. Some community-based organizations have an established reputation for supporting people who are undocumented. These organizations can include local clinics, community centers, county libraries, and places of worship. Your students may already know of a trusted community-based organization in their area. You could consider asking them where they normally go for help if they need it. And then asking that student can help them think through and identify their trusted sources of support. Then you might also learn about local resources that you could share with other students. One specific resource I'll point out is the Undocu Scholars website. This website includes a list of resources to help undocumented people access food, financial relief, legal help, medical help, and more. The list they have on their website is broken down into several categories. It includes nationwide resources, and it also has resources listed by state. So this is a helpful starting point for your students who might find it useful. Let's move ahead to the next question submitted in advance. It's, so, oh. an, oh, so another question that was submitted um, involves uh, frontline worker, front workers and access to personal protective equipment or PPE. It states the frontline workforce includes food workers and grocery store employees who are given limited personal protective equipment or PPE, even though they have lots of public engagement. How can they talk to employers about protective measures? Understandably, people may be uncomfortable asking their employer about providing supplies to keep themselves safe. And this can be a difficult conversation to have. So we offer a few strategies here. Um, bringing one's own personal uh, cloth mask from home is, uh, one, is one strategy. Um, so in that sense, the person is not relying on the employer, but they are able to bring um, some protective measures uh, from home. So here I've actually listed um, uh, several websites. The first two websites are from CDC, or the first is from CDC, the second is from Hopkins, and they talk about uh, the uh, rationale behind using a mask and what one needs to know um, when um, uh, in uh, placing a mask and how it can protect from um, COVID-19. Um, the third website, uh, also from the CDC, actually contains instructions on how to make one's own mask, um, including um, a, a set of instructions about how to make a mask for a t-shirt that can be done in under five minutes. Um, it's very user-friendly and uh, um, uh, at uh, uh, an eighth grade reading, reading level. Um, another strategy is to bring one's own personal latex or nitrile gloves, um, and that allows one to minimize contact with uh, surfaces. Um, and then um, some other strategies are, are listed here. So floor markers um, and signs that can uh, encourage social distancing among shoppers and customers 
um, are, are always helpful. Um, one can also um, uh, request that their employer provide physical barriers between the cashier or others that the customer may want to approach. Um, and these can be things like tape on the floor, um, which I've seen in some grocery stores, or even the use of orange traffic cones to surround the cashier or um, other uh, staff that customers um, uh, may try to approach. Um, and then um, um, the other uh, examples here are asking for cleaning and sanitation support. Uh, so making sure that hand sanitizer is available. Um, and in particular, um, the governor of Maryland actually uh, recently released a mandate um, requiring uh, one, that uh, all people wear masks when they are in uh, public settings, including grocery stores, pharmacies, and public transportation, and two, um, encouraging uh, frequent breaks uh, up to every 30 minutes um, so that employees have an opportunity to wash their hands. Um, and so I, and my hope is that other states are following or um, will follow uh, this suit. Uh, I'll turn it back over here to my colleague, Dr. Childers, to address some additional questions that were submitted. Um, I believe this might, this is our last um, question submitted in advance. Um, how do we support students' mental health? Some are afraid to leave the house. And we want them to know this is important without scaring them. Um, before we dive into this answer, I'd like to note that some of you mentioned that you have students who are not taking COVID-19 seriously enough, while others mentioned that you have students who are so worried they're afraid to leave their homes. So first I'd say it's important to tailor your message depending on your audience. For both groups, you can share the information and direct them to credible sources, explain how they can be prepared and take care of themselves and their family members. But perhaps your tone and your level of urgency in the way you deliver the message would be different depending on whether you're talking with that student who's not taking this seriously or the student who's very anxious about the virus. I'd also like to point out that you're a group of educators and service providers who care deeply for the students you serve. This was evident in the questions you asked about how best to support them. That connection and empathy can help students feel supported even as they are navigating these extremely stressful times. You might also feel that you've had to figure out how to manage your own stress during this time. Consider sharing what helps you manage stress with your students. The key here is preparation, not panic. People need the information and the tools necessary to feel prepared without panicking. Next slide, please. On this slide, we've listed um, several mental health resources here. These resources can assist students who are struggling with mental health concerns or crisis. Sharing this information with your students may also be a supportive anchor as they figure out where to turn when they need help. Next slide, please. And thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Childers and Shelton for going through that information. Sharon, our time is, this is Marianne again, and our time's about up. Uh, uh, a couple of questions, a few questions have been put into the Q&A pod and uh, in our remaining minute, I think we're even a minute over, I just want to add, uh, one of the questions is, is there copyright for sharing this FAQ? Trinita, I, I don't believe so, but can you answer if, if this is, the FAQ is freely shareable? The FAQ is definitely freely shareable. Um, we're hoping for wide dissemination um, for as many audiences as possible that might find it helpful. So feel free to share away. Great. And related to the uh, to that question in the FAQ, is there plans to translate the document into any other languages at this time? Uh, right now, um, we have it in English, Spanish, and Chinese. At this point, I'm not sure that it will be translated into Arabic yet. I saw that specific language was requested. Um, but we can keep that in mind and um, see if that's a possibility in the future. Terrific. And uh, we, we are, a, we got started a couple minutes late and we're a couple minutes over, but I will say uh, the chat pod has been very active. And I know, Sharon, there was a question about will the chat pod uh, be something that is retained and folks can share? That so, can share. Yeah, so we're going to do our best. Um, I have to look into that, but I believe we can save it. And if we can, we will. Um, I did also want to mention that there was one other question about when now that checks are being disseminated, will AIR update that information on their website? I think that was. Yeah, I don't think we would have plans to do that. There's um, 
the dissemination push around that is really uh, federal government and possibly state government purview. So that wouldn't be something we do. Um, and I have been tracking the, the chat comments and I see that there's a lot of practitioners who have been tuned in and very engaged throughout uh, and sharing ideas and uh, approaches to getting these resources uh, to students to dealing with, I think a lot of the comments had to do with if you have students who are reading at a level below which many of the published materials are currently um, available and so again this is an eighth grade level plain language tar tends to target about that eighth grade level um, so as we always do in adult education uh, we share practices for engaging our learners in this reliable information through um, visual uh, cues such as those shared through the Australian website that uh, Trinita was able to cover and ways of simplifying language while still sharing accurate information. Um, so those are lots of you shared and so hopefully you'll be able to see that afterwards uh, in the recorded version and the accompanying materials. And again, on behalf of American Institutes of Research, Sharon and Coabe, thank you. Uh, Again, you're always such an excellent partner, and we're really pleased to to do you're this with you among all the things we do together. You are so welcome, and we greatly appreciate it. Before people sign off, we'd like to take just a few minutes to launch a quick poll. Down here at the bottom, we're going to launch a poll. You're going to see it come up on your screen. So just one second here. Take one minute. Yep, click launch poll. There you go. Okay, if you could just take a minute and let us know what your thoughts are there um, to those that attended, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, and then I also just want to encourage you all that there's a few other things coming down the pipe. The, next, we have a few more webinars to give you the tools that you need to deal with the challenges of the COVID-19 crisis. So please check COVID.org for that. As well, we have a webinar coming up on the 21st at 2 super important webinar because we're looking at ways that we can bring funding in for the field. So please join us for that. I put the link in the chat box there. And then I also just wanna wish you all well and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. And again, special thank you to our partner there at American Institute for Research as well as our partner at Work Ready Mobile. Thank you everybody, we appreciate your time. So we'll sign off for now. Thank you.